Welcome. Well, you're at home with Jim and Joy, and we are so excited that you are with us today because today we have a great show, and we're yeah. so excited to bring a wonderful family member to you, Raymond Arroyo. We're excited about that. The world that. over. Yeah, so now you are an important part of the family and we want to hear from you. So we want you to send us an email, jimandjoy at EWTN.com. It is really true that we do answer our emails. If you send us prayer requests, we pray, we pray. over those prayer. We pray <laughs> over your requests. And um, so really stay in touch with us, jimandjoy at EWTN.com. Well, hun, we are. It's after Easter, right? And here we are in April, so beautiful. Seasons are changing and spring is coming and hope and yes. peace. Yes. Um, I hope everyone worked through all the beautiful things through Lent and in this beautiful year of divine mercy. Um, choosing by an act of our will, as hard as this might be, to forgive everyone Amen. everything. Yeah. And that's, that's, that's a, a real word for us all, especially yeah. during this year <clears throat> you, of divine mercy. You don't want to go through a whole year of divine mercy and have unforgiveness in your heart. I heard recently on radio that passage where Peter comes to Jesus and says, how many times must I forgive my brother who's sinned against me? Seven? And Jesus says, no, I say to you, 77 or seven times Seven. Seventy, whatever, mm -hmm. but seventy-seven times. And it doesn't mean just seventy-seven times. It's the number of perfection and, and completeness. And Jesus tells that story of the, the man who is in such great debt that he can't pay back. And yet the king releases him from the debt mm -hmm. because he's down on his knees weeping. And he was going to be sold into slavery. He, his wife, his kids. And the king, because of his repentance and sorrow, releases him this debt. And then he walks around and finds some guy that owes him, you know, like pocket change or something, mm -hmm. and says that he grabs the guy. Jesus is telling the story. He grabs the guy by the neck and says, you're going to pay me every cent. He has him thrown in jail. And some people observe this, and they told the king. And so he went to him and said, I forgave you this grand debt, like that you can never mm -hmm. repay, mm -hmm. and yet you grab this guy and choke him. He says, now you're going to have to pay for your debt and he handed him over to the torturers. I mean, it's like an unbelievable thing. Um, Jesus says, we have to forgive. I mean, this year of mercy, just search yourself. When I heard that story, really, I'm gonna tell you, I guess I'm, I have a little pride or something. I said, I have forgiven everyone. I don't have anybody held by the neck. And I felt pretty good until I went into the sanctuary, our, our sanctuary, and got before the tabernacle and looked at Jesus on the cross. And I started thinking, maybe there's other forms of unforgiveness, kind of like, I might not grab somebody by the neck. I might just be simmering them on a pan, you know what I mean? Like when the name comes up, sometimes I think negative thoughts, I say something negative because I'm truly not fully forgiving this person. So this person came to mind, that person came to mind, I said, oh Lord, please, I just, I release them. And so the word for you today and for all of us is don't go through the year of mercy for your own sake, for the sake of others, forgive from the heart. Forgive completely. Forgive now. It doesn't mean that this didn't happen. It doesn't mean that you might not even have to set some boundaries with some people. But now, today, let us forgive everyone, everything, in every way, and know that peace. For as you forgive, so you'll be forgiven. Well, and that is so important with in marriages, with our children, with our in-laws. And I know in my own life and in my own soul and in my sphere of friends and everything, I can't do life and love and forgiveness apart from God. Amen. I don't do it well. I, I fail. I, I'm not capable of this. And so we really have to give my a heart cry to the Lord and say, God, help me. God, help he me will. to love like you love and to live like you live and to, and to let him go and choose by an act of your will to let people go because in the end, you're only hurting yourself. And so really maximize on the rest of the time in this year of divine mercy. So forgive everyone, everything, as much as in your power. Lord, I choose by an act of my will 
to let it go. Well, today we're going to have a great show for you. We have the Mr. Famous Raymond Arroyo with us today, and we're so excited about that. Now, one thing you might not know about Raymond, he has the longest running live television show on EWTN. How could that be? He's so young, but he is. Well, he's going to be here. <laughs> we're going to have a great show. Hold on to your seats, grab a cup of coffee, and come be at home with Jim and Joy and with Raymond. Don't go away. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Well, you're at home with Jim and Joy, and today an extra special guest and time with us. We have Raymond Arroyo. Now, Raymond has authored a new book. It's a children's book. It's called Will Wilder, and it's The Relic of Perilous Falls. It sounds so exciting. Mm -hmm. It's intended for grades 8 through 12. It's item number 9592. You can get it right here on EWTN Religious Catalog. All you have to do is go to EWTNRC.com or call 1-800-854-6316. Raymond has authored many books, many about mother, which we have enjoyed reading Absolutely. and laughing and loving. So thank you, Raymond. Mm -hmm. Well, we want to welcome you oh, back to At you. Home with Jim and Joy. You've been here before. Yeah, I'm delighted to be back. Yeah. I came early on. You all were yeah. just starting, yeah. I think. Yeah, and they were, they were throwing in the, everybody in yeah. there. Yeah, it was quite a, a, a cavalcade then. Yeah. But yes, it's, yes. I watch the show. We watch it now. Rebecca Good. watches during the day. It's fantastic. Well, it's not the longest Thank running live show, but we're... You'll get there. <laughs> You'll get there. That is your title alone. Oh, well, I don't God know God bless that. you. So 20 years this September, Yeah, said? yeah. I'm, my age is starting to show. Yeah, the wrinkles are breaking out. No, it's been fun. It's been a great experience. I mean, when I look back uh, all these years, particularly being back in the studio mm -hmm. where it started, mm -hmm. the show started here in Birmingham. Uh, it's been incredible, an yeah. incredible journey. I mean, working with Mother on this, you know, this mm -hmm. very ground. Mm -hmm. uh, we would do the, the live show, Mother Angelica Live. Uh, the, the last few years she did it, I, I co-hosted with her. Right. Marcus mm -hmm. Grote, I did yeah. as well. Yeah. And uh, it was it was a wonderful time. Mm -hmm. I learned a lot from her. Mm -hmm. And uh, all of that, I still, I mean, I use it every week. I use sure. it every, every time I'm in front of the camera and most of the time when I'm away from it. Well, you are a good son of Mother oh, Angelica. Thank you. you really are. Thank now, you. you've done a new thing. You've written... A children's book. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So what is that all about? What possessed you? Possessed is the write? operative <laughs> word, Joy. What possessed you to write this children's book? You know, book? children's books, I always think they usually come from a relationship with a child. Mm -hmm. And in my in my life, it's my, my two boys and my little girl, Mariella. And when they were very young, I would tell them, I often say Will Wilder was born as a soap opera mm -hmm. because <laughs> when they were soaping up and in the tub, I would have to tell them stories right. to get them out of the tub mm -hmm. and get them, you know, dried mm -hmm. and in right. the pajamas and out the it's door. It's such a process. Yeah, and you mm -hmm. know, the, so mm -hmm. I figured if I tell them a little story and it's a slapstick story and it's fun and it's a little scary around the edges, they'll do what I say mm -hmm. and I would withhold plot points until they moved on to the next process. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. you know, get in, I'll tell mm -hmm. you the beginning of the story. Right. Okay, now it's mm -hmm. time to get out. Here's the towel. I'll mm -hmm. tell you what happens next. Mm -hmm. Put your pajamas on, I'll finish the story. Yeah. And then I'd leave a little cliffhanger for the next night. Mm -hmm. Well, the characters that emerged from that were Will Wilder, his family, some of the friends around the periphery. Now, they were just nascent, silly characters. I deepened them. I, I wrote backstory for them. I'm right. talking pages mm -hmm. of biography mm -hmm. for each character. Mm -hmm. Where did they come from? What did they like? Their family. And eventually, a story kind of took shape. Mm -hmm. And it was when I was reading, I guess it was in the Irish Times, I think it was, and it was a relic in an Irish church that had been stolen. Mm -hmm. And it was the heart of a saint in a lead box, and it was up in chains in a cage above the altar. Wow. Someone had actually broken in and taken it. That's a big, I mean, I understand, you know, you see the relic where, you the relic where nobody's looking, right. and you walk out the church. I'm sorry to speak. But the your heart relic of a saint. But the heart of a saint from a lead box is quite a theft. Yes. And I thought, this is a great idea. Mm -hmm. First of all, I've always been fascinated with relics because relics tell us something about our past mm -hmm. and our future. Mm -hmm. They, they uh, in some cases, it's a bone, it can be a piece of fabric, mm -hmm. but it points to a special time. Mm -hmm. And really our whole history, our, not only our Western civilization, but Christian history is bound up in these relics, these things we can touch and feel. 
So I thought, what if a little boy lived in a town where his great-grandfather had constructed a museum that kept and stored these antiquities and relics of history? Mm -hmm. And what if he, a 12-year-old, impetuous, headstrong kid, decided to <clears throat> steal, borrow, mm -hmm. one of those mm -hmm. relics mm -hmm. for his own purposes? Mm -hmm. What might happen? Mm -hmm. So the ensuing story is really a multi-book tale. Um, it's, a, it's an adventure series. It's not just one book. There's mm -hmm. a whole series of them. I've already finished the second one. I'm on mm -hmm. my way to three. Um, and Will Wilder and his family kind of presented themselves. Kids have loved the mm, book. Yeah. Um, it, it's, you know, it's one of the reviews, book list, uh, which is the American Library Association's periodical mm -hmm. that really reviews children's books that they think are worthy. And they said, this is a, a somewhere between Indiana Jones and Percy Jackson, mm -hmm. but it's the next great adventure mm. for the middle grade set. Wonderful. So I, I, it's been so gratifying, yeah. traveling to schools, talking to librarians and teachers. And the story really came from them. Mm -hmm. I polled a lot of librarians and teachers as I worked on this book. Yeah. And they helped me modulate certain things, accentuate certain things that kids are looking for. Mm -hmm. They wanted to be scared around the edges. Nothing gory, mm -hmm. but they wanted to be scared and challenged a little bit. They liked adventure. Girls liked relationships mm -hmm. and the family dynamic. Right. So I wove all of that in. Yeah. And uh, I think the series is, you know, it's a fun, wild ride that the whole family can go on. And you actually can learn about history mm -hmm. and these relics that are real. You can go mm -hmm. see them, yeah. touch them. Yeah. This genre that you've written in here, mm -hmm. have you written in this genre before? Never. Children's fiction, no. it's characters. But you know, I, I, I've never written fiction before. This is my first fiction okay. book. Mm -hmm. However, I, as an actor in my earlier life, I was an actor and I, I was immersed in fiction. But fiction is really imaginative reality. Mm -hmm. When you're an actor, you, you look at all these characters, whether you're playing Richard III or you're playing Henry V, you, you put the character on and you have to justify their actions. You have to figure out internally, how can I believe this wholeheartedly mm -hmm. and, and convey this to an audience? Mm -hmm. I'm really doing the same thing. The only difference is I don't have to go do seven shows a week, eight shows a week. Right. I don't have to put a costume on. Mm -hmm. I sit in a corner in my office or in a coffee shop. Mm -hmm. These characters come to life. They live here. Mm -hmm. I talk to my imaginary friends, mm -hmm. and I write what they say mm -hmm. out on the page. That's amazing. Then you edit it, and you change it, and it's a lot of... I, I will say this. The genre is the hardest thing I've ever had to write. Mm. I thought biography is hard because you have to interview so many people, assemble it, but that's basically like a puzzle. Mm -hmm. You're putting the puzzle together when you're doing a piece of nonfiction. With this, it is an emotional work because you're not only creating a plot, which I plot out, I write the whole plot out, mm -hmm. which takes a lot of time, mm -hmm. but then you have to emotionally enter that world, sit down, enter the world, be with these characters, and there are times, and in this book it happened, in the second book it happened mm -hmm. a lot, you think you're going to go down this way, and suddenly the character right. says this mm -hmm. and everything turns. Mm -hmm. So you have to adjust your whole outline. Sure. But that's responding to the reality of where these characters that you set in motion took you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, you're, you're uh, and that's, it's great. It's, it's a wonderful you're experience. That the character said this and then you have to go that yeah. way. You're saying this as if you're not in control of it. You didn't make them say that. Like, what is this about? Yeah. So h how do you... It's, it's so, a, you get your characters, then how do they yes. develop? You got an acting background, plus you yes. got a journalist background. Do you write it all out? Do they come alive to you? You see them acting? Yes. What, what, yeah, I see them in that. my head. I see them in my head. I can hear them. And, and, and there, you'll see their ticks these characters have. One, you know, one stammers, one, you know, talks in a certain dialect from New Orleans. The, uh, the characters have their own identity for mm -hmm. me. Mm -hmm. And then I, the challenge is to impart that onto the written word mm -hmm. so that it conveys to an audience. And that's wow. hard. That, I mean, I getting the reality yeah. of that out and the diversity of those characters and their sounds out. Um, that becomes a challenge. And keeping the plot going. Kids have no, mm -hmm. zero attention span. Right. Kids want the story right now. Right. Mm -hmm. so this and then is, what happens. Right. right. And then mm -hmm. what, what happens next. Right. This mm -hmm. is very action-packed. Mm -hmm. There's a lot for them to get their arms mm -hmm. around. But I, I outline, and I also do a lot of imaginative work. So when I say right. they say that right. to me, I am in the imaginative moment with that character. You know, I, 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 I can hear Will. Uh, yeah, I'm doing it. But... It's also, you're kind of imagining and ricocheting, well, what if he said that, and what if mm -hmm. he said, oh, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. And that's what I mean by, they told me to do mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. It's really you asking the questions. And that's what a novelist does. We don't provide answers. 
even this book, this is not a book of answers. Mm -hmm. It's not a catechism. This, mm -hmm. not, mm -mm. this is a book of questions. Mm -hmm. You get to go on a journey with a character. And what I love about fiction is it's a passport. This is a passport mm -hmm. for a family and right. kids to go to a different world mm -hmm. and to inhabit the mind and the heart of these characters, good or bad. Yeah. And when you do that, you discover things about yourself mm -hmm. as the pro you come up with the answers. Sure. You and your parents. And what mm -hmm. I love about this is parents are talking about with their kids, mm -hmm. what's a relic? Right. What, what, what's, what's the, how did this happen? Mm -hmm. is, is this real, Mom? Yeah. And what they find out is a lot of this stuff is real. I've woven the fiction and the mm -hmm. reality, the history together. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot to unpack. And uh, as the series unveils itself, mysteries become clearer. Will's family becomes more apparent to him. His personal gift, he has a supernatural gift. Mm -hmm. And we wrestle with those gifts. Yeah. I mean, even in our own lives. Mm -hmm. Will right. has a supernatural gift? He does. He can see things no one else can. Mm -hmm. And he later finds out he's part of an ancient prophecy that his family has been protecting. Mm -hmm. And when he stumbles upon it, he realizes he is central to that prophecy. Mm -hmm. And the question it begs is, can the actions of a 12-year-old change the world? Uh Mm -hmm. That sounds familiar. You mm -hmm. get to answer the rest of it. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Now, what is the relic that Will is after? Oh, yeah. There's a real, there's mm -hmm. a real relic mm -hmm. here. Well, they're all real relics. Right. But in this book, the primary relic that he chases down is the finger bone of St. Thomas, mm -hmm. the apostle. Mm -hmm. Now, that was chosen with intent. Um, the finger bone of St. Thomas, you can actually see in the Church of the Holy Cross right. in, of Jer in Jerusalem, mm -hmm. in Rome, mm -hmm. uh, Santa Croce. Right. And uh, it, it's... it's you see, they call it the phalange of St. Thomas. It's yeah. there in a reliquary. And I thought it would be neat, and I could weave in both um, that story, the story mm -hmm. of St. Thomas, mm -hmm. into Will's own story. Mm -hmm. So it all, you get reflections of things real and imagined that kind of informed and opened the story for me as an author, and I think for the reader as well. Yeah. Yeah. What's the setting of the book? What time period are we in? Is it modern times now? Contemporary, right now. Mm -hmm. it's, it, in Perilous Falls is uh, a destination all its own. You won't find it on a map, but it exists. Mm -hmm. right here. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I think in the hearts of a lot of people. And what I love is I've been getting letters from kids, fifth graders, fourth graders, mm -hmm. and parents. Mm -hmm. I, I've got everybody from eight to 80 has read this book. Mm -hmm. And uh, from, it's very interesting. The letters and the feedback, I, I didn't expect... Kids get one thing from it. They take the wild ride. They love the adventure. They want to know what happens next. Mm -hmm. Adults come away with something very mm -hmm. different. And it was written on those two levels yeah. because half of the audience for middle grade fiction is 18 and older. Mm -hmm. So you have to be aware of that as you're writing. And I was. I was very cognizant of that, that this is a book and a series that I hope people will explore and love and go on the journey as young people. Mm -hmm. And it's something that I hope they'll re-encounter when they get older because they'll find a different story there, I think, well, because I mean, of them. It's so perfect, especially for summer vacation coming up, oh, yeah. right? Everyone getting in the car and taking road trips and reading and, yeah. and hearing and loving and, you know, yeah. everyone sharing it. I mean, it would just be wonderful for a family journey. Yeah. And that's a great what I adventure. want. Huge yeah. homeschool population watching, too, mm -hmm. so this yeah. would be great for them. Yeah. No, well, it's great. I, I think it's for any educator, for parents... I, what I really wanted with this story is first to give kids an imaginative fun ride. My mm -hmm. first job is to entertain. Right. That's first. Mm -hmm. And then I wanted to allow a conversation to happen between parents mm -hmm. and their kids. And if you go to RaymondArroyo.com, I have not only a study guide, but there's a family discussion guide oh, online perfect. that breaks down questions, there's mm. games, there's a scavenger hunt. It's something families can do, and it's all done for you. All you have to do is have fun and enjoy the book together. Well, that'll be perfect. Yeah. Well, we are going to head straight for a break. Don't go away. We'll be right back, and we will have more with wonderful Raymond. So don't go away. We'll be right back. Wonderful.
Welcome back. Well, we're here having a wonderful discussion with Raymond Arroyo, who's talking about his brand new book, Will Wadler, The Relic of Perilous Falls. And you can get this book. It's item number 9592. You can order it on EWTN Religious Catalog. You can just go to EWTNRC.com or you can call 1-800-854-6316. You might have some children. You might have some grandchildren. It's a great read. It's a great adventure. And you don't want to miss it. Mm. Well, right now, we have a trailer for the oh. book. So let's take a look. He alone can see them, the dark things we ignore. Twelve-year-old Will Wilder sought a relic with rare powers. Now, he has awoken an ancient evil, and the only way to save the town of Perilous Falls is to embrace his destiny before it's too late. So long as he isn't grounded at the time. Jim Flaherty calls it a pulse-pounding page-turner. Think Indiana Jones meets Percy Jackson. Dean Koontz raves, great fun and great frights. The search for the next epic must-read adventure series is over. Will Wilder, The Relic of Perilous Falls by Raymond Arroyo. Premiering March 8th from Random House Kids. Bam, 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 bam. Uh, that's uh, exciting. Powerful, powerful, powerful. It's fun. Oh, it's Is, a lot of fun. Who's using the book? And, we know parents, yeah. grandparents, and uh, I said homeschoolers. Yeah. Is it crossing over any in public schools, Catholic yes, schools? Yes, it's ev everybody's reading this book. I mean, it's it's. I'm amazed at how it's been embraced. I've spoken to public schools, Catholic schools, Jewish schools. Um, it, it's mm -hmm. been it's been an amazing experience watching the reach and the diversity again. People, kids, are hungry mm -hmm. for an adventure series that they can go on a wild ride with mm -hmm. and on. Mm -hmm. And I think they see themselves. Some of the letters I get, they say, when I was reading the book, I really felt like Will at that moment. Mm -hmm. And I was so worried that, mm -hmm. you know, he was mm -hmm. going to be caught or that something would happen. And this great little fifth grader who wrote me very early on, he was the first letter I got. His teacher was at the American Library Association, got an early copy of the book. Mm -hmm. And he sent me this letter. And the end of it, it was so sweet. He said, just please tell me, when is the next book coming? Oh, bless his and heart. here's what I learned. Mm -hmm. Literature is real fun, mm -hmm. and a 12-year-old can really change the world. I went, Touché. Oh. You know, there I you started go. crying yeah. when I read the book, when I read the letter, because yeah. I thought, that is why I wrote it. Mm -hmm. You want to empower kids. Mm -hmm. You want them to know their choices matter. And what I love about this series is, it is a wild adventure. Supernatural things happen. This kid encounters dark things he mm -hmm. never expected nor wanted to mm -hmm. uncork. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But he's confronted with them. Mm -hmm. And it demonstrates that our actions have consequences. And this is a coherent moral universe. So many books today, you have a fractured moral universe right. where you're, you're, what we would think of as a villain mm -hmm. is actually the good guy. Oh, yeah. And yeah. the people you would think of as the good guy, they're really the villains. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's not how this series rolls mm -hmm. out. There's mm -hmm. a coherent moral universe. I mm -hmm. think it helps kids understand the world they're in. The, 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 the uncertainty they have in their own lives, the challenges of dealing with family. Mm -hmm. One of the things I love about the series, too, and I did this intentionally. Initially, I thought, eh, I'll do this for dramatic purposes, and that really was the first instinct. Then I thought, this differentiates this series. Every other middle grade series, just about, that you encounter, you will find an orphan, Mm -hmm. A kid whose parents recently are deceased, right. or they're searching for their parents, or right. they've been abandoned. It's a kid alone in the world. Right. The fact is, whether a child is really an orphan mm -hmm. or, or from a single parent family like mm -hmm. my father was, mm -hmm. th no child is alone. There mm -hmm. are adults and, and mentors and parents around you in some way. Will has an intact family, mm -hmm. dysfunctional, mm -hmm. but intact. Right. His great aunt Lucille. Like all of our like families. Like all of our families. <laughs> His great aunt Lucille is mm -hmm. really at the center of this story. Mm -hmm. She's the keeper of the flame. She's the one who remembers the family that was, that nobody wants to talk about, the mm -hmm. great grandfather, the history of the museum. We still don't know why it's there. Why are mm -hmm. these relics being collected? And what happens in the story, you saw a little bit in the trailer. Will's a 12 year old kid, he gets into trouble. He hears about this relic that his grandfather has, has collected, and he figures, if I can borrow that relic, and if it has healing abilities, he doesn't believe that, but mm -hmm. he thinks if, mm -hmm. if I can borrow it, maybe I can get out of this punishment. I'll heal my brother's arm, which I broke, mm -hmm. bring it back, all's well all that ends good. well, and yeah. I'll get out of my uh -huh. punishment. Yeah. Yeah. Selfish motive. Mm -hmm. 
as things turn out, Will really unleashes um, a very dark force that mm -hmm. he never imagined, and mm -hmm. it's tied to his great-grandfather's mm -hmm. story. Mm -hmm. So everything is interconnected. Yeah. Yeah. My yeah. story, your story, mm -hmm. your children's stories, it's all one thing. Mm -hmm. And there's a great line in the book that uh, Mr. Shin, who is one of Will's mentors, he says, Mr. Wilder, if you don't know your past, you'll never discover your future. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. an important thing for kids to get. Right. And the series really speaks to that. Well, that is so wonderful. Now, I'm curious, uh -oh. as all curious minds are, what was it like for your family, oh. your beautiful <laughs> wife, Rebecca, your children, for you to take on this project? No. Right? I mean, what what was that like? Was what it did, perilous or was, was it, it fun? It, <laughs> well, it was perilous. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's perilous. She, she sent me on the book tour and she locked me out of the house, changed all the locks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she, uh, Rebecca, I often say, this. Is, yeah, I wrote the series, mm -hmm. but Rebecca and the children really are the, are the incubators mm -hmm. of the series, mm -hmm. and they paid a heavy price for the series. Mm -hmm. What I didn't realize when I started this journey into children's fiction, I had written all these nonfiction books, books of comedy, biography, uh, I've, I've edited things, prayer books, everything. I, I could do that on the side, mm -hmm. on airplanes, after dinner, little, right. little snatches. Right. You, you, you start writing, if you know where you're going, you can mm -hmm. just jump in mm -hmm. and you're fine. Mm -hmm. It'll keep its tone. In fiction, you don't have that luxury. Mm -hmm. You have to enter into this world, and that means three, four, or five hour blocks. Mm -hmm. Because wow. it takes you a good hour just to get just back to, get to Perilous in. Falls mm -hmm. and to mm -hmm. Will and into Aunt Lucille's head. Mm -hmm. People ask me, you know, I'll sit in the corner of the coffee shop and I'm writing. <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, what, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm talking to my imaginary friends. Right. <laughs> I'm yeah. writing, I'm yeah. a writer. And you know, you do see, it, mm -hmm. it is odd because you go to these places and you're carrying this world and these people around with you in your head mm -hmm. and you have to get them out um, and it takes a lot of time to do that mm -hmm. but people say oh was this based on your kid or was that based on somebody you mm -hmm. knew or was that based mm -hmm. on they're all me they're mm -hmm. all little pieces of me of every range. character mm -hmm. every character you create right. is a piece of you right. Right. so it takes something out of you too mm -hmm. so I, I just felt at the end of a session I am wrung out mm -hmm. I mean after four or five hours I am Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I just don't even want to look at a page again. But you have to go back and you have to keep telling the story mm -hmm. and uh, and make it fun and write cliffhangers in and keep it interesting and create a puzzle kids will love. Yeah. There's a, it, it yeah. operates on multiple levels, but it's emotionally engaging. Mm -hmm. And without Rebecca and the kids permitting me that time, which was family time. Mm -hmm. and I don't golf. Mm -hmm. I don't go to movies a lot. Mm -hmm. I don't do a lot of recreation. Mm -hmm. This is my recreation. Mm -hmm. I write. Mm -hmm. um, there's a great Sondheim song uh, called Finishing the Hat from a show called Sunday in the Park with George. He's a painter, mm -hmm. and, the, and he's, he's painting a hat. And the song goes, finishing the hat, how you have to finish the hat, how you look at your life through a window mm -hmm. while you finish the hat. Mm -hmm. And I often think of that mm -hmm. when there's a, there's, an, there's a window at the top of my office, and my children run by and kick balls and play mm -hmm. outside. And I am looking at my life mm -hmm. through a window sometimes. Mm -hmm. but. They feed my fiction. Right. They are my greatest focus group. When I finish a chapter, I'll convene the kids and their friends at different ages. Yeah. 10, right. 12, They give 16. you constructive criticism? Constructive. <laughs> they give me criticism. I don't know about constructive. No, they do. They give constructive criticism on characters. Why is that happening? This mm -hmm. is boring. Mm -hmm. So I've cut <laughs> scenes. I've mm -hmm. slashed characters. Mm -hmm. I changed a couple of characters yeah. mm -hmm. because of that feedback. Yeah. So sure. they have spared me. Mm -hmm. So many mistakes, mm -hmm. and I think enriched the story for kids. Yeah. Kids love the story, and adults come away with, I think, a lot more than they expected to. Well, that's wonderful. Yeah. We're going to go straight to an email, oh, Raymond. Okay. okay, so with the pervasiveness of social media, television and online streaming, and constant connection to smartphones, what would make young people want to pick up books again? When I was young, I loved to read books, but today's young people mm. make reading, bo reading books seems like it's outdated or it's old-fashioned. Mm. Is this younger generation hopeless? And this is Ken from Vermont. Mm. You know, Ken, uh, the reason I wrote the series was because when I talked to librarians about reluctant readers, they told me what kids liked and what they didn't have enough of. Mm. I don't believe in force-fed reading. I think that's a bad idea. Let the child go and discover mm -hmm. what they initially like. They will find their mm -hmm. way to the classics. Mm -hmm. If you force feed Shakespeare and Charles Dickens on a 10-year-old, mm -hmm. they are not going to embrace it. Mm -hmm. And they may never go back to it for the rest of their lives. That's bad. 
Let them enter where they're ready. You know, my son, he, he, for one of my kids, it was Huck Finn. Mm -hmm. For another kid, right. it, was, right. it was comic books mm -hmm. and kingdom keepers mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. the diary of a wimpy kid. Right. That was their way into reading. Mm -hmm. Now they're reading Sherlock Holmes mm -hmm. and Jules Verne, mm -hmm. but they're older. Mm -hmm. That wasn't the entry point. So my feeling is I wanted to write a contemporary adventure that had some solid values and, and a strong storyline that ki a journey kids would want to go on. Right. I disagree. I don't think there's any child alive who doesn't want to engage his imagination and go on a real adventure mm -hmm. and hear a great story. Mm -hmm. There is no child alive. Mm -hmm. I, I was speaking to Dean Koontz the other day, who's written, oh my gosh, you know, sold 450 million copies. I should be so lucky. Mm -hmm. um, and Dean was saying, I feel so bad when adults read my books and they come back and say, well, this would never have happened and that would never have happened. And that, mm -hmm. he said, your imagination is starved right. and it's shrunken and you've gotten right. old before your time. Mm. And I feel that. Mm -hmm. Part of our obligation is storytellers. And when I entered this and I said, why, you know, I had my own reflection. Why do you want to write mm -hmm. fiction for kids? And I thought, when I stepped back, I've been a storyteller my whole life. As an actor, I was a storyteller, except I told the story mm -hmm. through the character. Mm -hmm. As a journalist, I'm a storyteller, telling other stories and stories I find, dramatizing those, pulling out the best parts, driving a narrative. This is a different type of storytelling, but I would argue it's the most important. Mm. These are kids between 8, 5, and 18. This is your opportunity to get them when their imagination is so rich, right. they're so available, mm -hmm. they so want a story. Mm -hmm. So I am so honored to be someone that they go on the ride with, mm -hmm. and they're willing to embrace Will and, uh, and take this journey with us. Yeah. So that's a great honor. It's a yeah. gift. It's well, a it, gift. it's so important because they're so fertile at that time. Oh, yeah. And you could lose them to a yeah. screen, right. uh, to video games, mm -hmm. you know, and where they're not encountering anything. No, they're not encountering life. They're, they're not encountering, it, it's just, it's a screen. But those video games tell great stories now. Mm -hmm. They're better than movies. They're making more than movies. Right. They're costing $150, $200 million right. to make, and they're, they're bringing in a billion dollars a game. Mm -hmm. But, you know, my, my, own, my older children play mm -hmm. some of these games. Mm -hmm. And I watch them, and I'm thinking, it's not the game that holds them. It's the great, well-told story around the game. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of video clips right. that run before they enter into gaming mode. Right. It's a come on. Right. It's a story. Mm -hmm. That's, that storytelling is really good. Mm -hmm. Well done. Well structured. I wanted to bring that same competency for structure to a great, fun character mm -hmm. where you can have a laugh. And you, and you can learn something and feel something along the way. Mm -hmm. That's what I hope I've done with the Will Wilder well, series. Well, I'm sure you have, and that's exciting. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, you know, as we're having this conversation yeah. and this technology kind of society and digital learning and so on, mm -hmm. I guess one of the things is children, there's a lot of ways to read books, right? You can sure. read them online. But I just have something about wanting to introduce children to real, like, books. Well, you know. The feel of a book, that kind of thing. The you know? tactile experience. Yeah. Mm. Well, you know what they're learning. I think they could lose that. Mm. They don't even know that. Well, and that's, that's right. what joys you. Well, you know, there's a recent study, and I, I can't remember if it was The Guardian uh, or Publishers, Week Publishers Weekly, I think, released it. What they found when they did surveys, children, now we inundate them with tablets right. and Kindles mm -hmm. and Nooks. Mm -hmm. What they've discovered is kids, by 80%, like want a hard oh, book. It's, it's, it's true. tactile. It's, it's real. True. You can see the illustrations. You can flip back and forth mm -hmm. and you own it. Mm -hmm. It's yours. It's right. something to keep. And it's amazing when kids come up to you and they say, would you sign this, Mr. Mm -hmm. Roy? And they open it. It's like something. It's its own relic mm -hmm. to them. Mm -hmm. It's something mm -hmm. precious and sacred and it's a part of their lives. And I, you know, I get misty eyed when I talk oh. about this. When I think about the books I read as a kid, Charlotte's Web, mm -hmm. Sherlock Holmes. Right. I have those editions. They're mm -hmm. still on my shelf. Mm -hmm. My first edition of uh, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, mm -hmm. which I've read mm -hmm. to all my kids, and mm -hmm. it's on their shelf now. Right. That is an heirloom, a relic that you pass on. And that's what I'm talking about in this series. Mm -hmm. The importance of treasured things and what they represent and passing the story along to the next generation. Mm -hmm. That's what we're here yeah. for. Right. That's what the faith is about. Mm -hmm. That's what 
these stories are all about right. passing it on to the next generation and and the and the encounter of being with another human being even if you're sitting and reading a story yeah. we do it with our grands and there's the one chair they know right. that's where known is going to sit uh -huh. and we're going to get that one book and we're all going to and say it again and do the page i mean but just that encounter right. that you had and we have 15 grands we've done it mm. from the 15 year old all the way down to the 1 year old wow. same dag on one little book that they all really really like <laughs> <laughs> but it's but it's that encounter, right? Yep, so you can yep. sit down and curl up and grab the book and and go away. And they'll never yeah. forget it. They'll right. never forget that mm -hmm. contact. And mm -hmm. we now learn when you look at the brain studies mm -hmm. with the the deep studies that the New School for Social Research and NYU and others have done. They've discovered that that bond mm -hmm. it creates empathy, mm -hmm. understanding for other human beings, stories and stories told. Right teach children mm -hmm. and all of us mm -hmm. how to be human, mm -hmm. how to be full human beings. Right. Because you're in the mind, in the heart of mm -hmm. other characters. And then when you see real people in life, you're identifying them. Mm -hmm. But what they've done, from, what they found from brain studies, when you're reading a book of fiction, and it's only in fiction, mm -hmm. you are so attached to that character, you think of them and your brain processes them as, as real, real people. I bet. Mm -hmm. And that's why fiction is so powerful. This mm -hmm. is incidentally also why I believe Jesus Christ never, ever preached to his audience. Wow. He told them stories, mm -hmm. parables, because they could imagine it, see it, mm -hmm. enter into it. They were that guy on the road mm -hmm. where the Samaritan mm -hmm. picked him up. Mm -hmm. They were the people who, you know, the, they were that fig yeah. tree yeah, <laughs> that was right. about right. to get crushed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They could identify with those stories. They were part of their lives. And that's what all storytellers do. It's part of our craft and art. We're going to take a break at this Good. point. More with Raymond Arroyo. I think it's Raymond Arroyo. You might be in oh, Arroyo, you got Arroyo, another character or something. <laughs> no, 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 don't do that. We'll be right back. More on uh, literacy and, and reading. We'll be right back. Don't go away. Welcome back. Well, guess what? You are an important part of the family, and you can come and join us live on At Home. We would love that. You could sit in the audience. You can meet our wonderful guests. But more than that, you could take a great pilgrimage to EWTN. All you have to do is contact the EWTN Pilgrimage Department, and you can do that by emailing pilgrimages at EWTN.com, or you can give them a call at 205 271 to 966 Irondale, Alabama could is absolutely Raymond beautiful. Arroyo today you could have met Raymond Missed right out. here. There <laughs> you go. Out. See, you were procrastinating. You shouldn't have done Not that. A lot of call You never know. All right, well, right now we're going to go straight to an email. My husband and I grew up with the Harry Potter series, and it was a huge part of our childhood. Some very devout Catholic veteran parents have warned against allowing our children to read these types of books because if our kids are exposed to magic, mm. they may become interested in the occult. My husband and I turned out fine, but is there merit to these warnings? And this is from Kimberly. Mm, it's an interesting story. Uh, I'll, I'll back up a little bit and answer it in a roundabout way. First of all, uh, the Harry Potter series, it is, you know, as a writer, you have to step back and you look at those seven books and you go, this is an incredible piece of architecture, just mm -hmm. telling this story mm -hmm. for so yeah. long. Um, I would argue there are some who say the same thing about Tolkien. They say the same thing about uh, C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis had magic in it. Um, Tolkien, where J.K. Rowling, by the way, took a lot of inspiration. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Tolkien has wizards, and, and there were dark lords and wizards. I mean, there's a lot happening yeah. in those mm -hmm. orcs and horrible things. Um, magic is, is, in some ways, an allegory for belief, for faith. Mm -hmm. And in a child's mind, I'll use the Chesterton quote, and I'm, I will butcher this, but he said, I, we have to write about dragons so the children understand them when they see them in the real world. Mm, that's that's true. kind mm -hmm. of, and my book deals with mm -hmm. dark things mm -hmm. too that mm -hmm. Will Wilder uncorks. Um, but it's an imaginative journey. 
it's part of fairy tales. It's part of the, st the big story. Mm -hmm. So, look, I'm not going to say one way or the other uh, about Harry Potter. I mean, I think every parent has to decide for themselves. I will say this. The Harry Potter series, the central pin that it spun upon was wizardry, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, Rick Riordan, who did, did the Percy Jackson series, the central turning point of his series are Greek gods. Mm -hmm. And the center turning point of my series is relics and antiquities, mm -hmm. historical antiquities. Mm -hmm. This is great. Everybody has an opportunity here. You can choose what you want. It's mm -hmm. available to you. Mm -hmm. They're all great adventure stories. Each tell their story in a different way. You'll have to figure out what's best for your family. Mm -hmm. What I love is um, the, one of the people affiliated with the woman who launched Harry Potter, Barbara Marcus, mm -hmm. who's the president at Random House, is the same woman who bought my Will Wilder series oh. at Random House. Oh and uh, she's an incredible mm -hmm. visionary. She saw you know, the, ser the potential for the mm -hmm. series early on, brought Harry to America, mm -hmm. launched the whole series, in addition to Goosebumps and the Babysitter's Club, right. things that have become staples mm -hmm. for a lot of kids. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I'm honored and thrilled to be part of that trajectory and to be at Random House. I mean, this is the house that Dr. Seuss built. Yeah. Um, it's mm -hmm. a venerable, wonderful, mm -hmm. the largest mm -hmm. children's publisher in the mm -hmm. world. And to be mm -hmm. part of that legacy for me and Will is yeah. Uh, yeah. pretty That's incredible. That's exciting, yeah. It's pretty incredible. Hilarious promote it? I mean, are you having to travel, go all oh, over the Oh, I've been on a 20-city 20 bo 20 book tour. I'll do more than that. Uh, mm -hmm. I've visited, oh, probably 30 schools, and I've got more ahead. Uh, it's, it's important, though. It's what I love about this. Usually, I do a few media hits, and then I go away, and the book rolls on. Right. Here, you keep engaging with your readers, mm -hmm. and kids are so lively. They mm -hmm. tell you immediately what they like, what they don't like. Reluctant readers have come up to me and said, you know, I never really liked a series before, but this was so cool, mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm asking Mom to get me a pith helmet like Will. <laughs> right. you know, so yeah. They're yeah. really in it. Mm -hmm. They're so What's engaged. A pith, a pith helmet is what Will's wearing here. It's, a, it's an old mm -hmm. helmet. Uh, his grandfather, Jacob Wilder, in World War II, wore this pith helmet. Now, it's really scarred up. It's got a chunk out of it on the side where something took a bite out of it. There's scratches on the front. But Will treasures this. He, it was given to him by his great aunt Lucille. We find out as the books go on, it has real importance, but I'm not saying anything mm -hmm. else. But it, it's, it's a lot of fun, but it's become identified with Will and okay. his adventures. So. Can you mention any other relics involved? In this in the book? Uh, well, in this book, there is Old Testament, too. There's New Testament, which is St. Thomas's finger. Mm -hmm. The Old Testament is the mantle of Elijah, mm -hmm. Elijah's mantle. Now, and this is what I'm saying, it opens up all kinds of questions. Mm -hmm. I had a Jewish mother come up to me and said, thank you for writing this right. book. And I said, well, what, what, what did you, mm -hmm. why are you saying? She said, my son came up to me and he said, mom, is this stuff real? Mm -hmm. I mean, they got this St. Thomas gun. She was like, yeah, 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 we'll talk about that mm -hmm. later. But there's this Elijah's mantle. Yes. And it gave her an opportunity to really mm -hmm. read that portion of the, the Old Testament, mm -hmm. the scripture mm -hmm. to her mm -hmm. son. Mm -hmm. They kind of walked through it. And then he found out his grandfather was a rabbi at mm -hmm. one point, and mm -hmm. it opened up his own story. Mm -hmm. That's what I. That's why I wanted to write the series, mm -hmm. to get kids to talk to their parents and grandparents, great grandparents, about everybody that went before, because those journeys do light your way. Mm -hmm. And that's Will's story. That's all of our stories that in some way. So I love that that a conversation is happening and literacy is happening. Mm -hmm. More importantly. Yeah. Email Trump. Well, we're going to go straight to another email. Uh -oh. It says, it's been so long since I've picked up a good fiction novel. I don't have much time to read because I work full time and come home to spend time with my family. Uh -huh. I'd really like to start reading again. Can you help me find ways to make time to read? Mm -hmm. And this is Pat from Florida. Poor Pat. Pat, I sympathize with you a lot. Um, one thing you can do, I, this book, this the Will Wilder series, I read the audio book of this and all, I think it's 30 voices. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, the, I'm getting concerned. Oh, about yeah. The, I do the full <laughs> Sybil Poor treatment. Rebecca. Oh, no, no. The whole, very the whole bipolar thing and multi personalities is on full glorious display. Good and bad. Good, Raymond. Very bad. Um, but it, it, that's one way of reading. You can at least encounter the ideas, the storylines mm -hmm. as you drive. We spend a lot of time in traffic. It's a good way to read. The other thing is carve time out for yourself. Mm -hmm. You need to make time for yourself. Find those quiet moments when you can just get away. And if it's a good book, 
and I pray mine are. Mm. Uh, if it's a good book, people will find time to get back to it because you, as well as your children, want to know what happened. Mm -hmm. And that's a great way. I had a, a, a brother, uh, Rayfield, I always remember him. When I'm talking to parents and they ask me, you know, how do I get my kids to read, mm -hmm. which is the big challenge, right. with all the things happening. Mm -hmm. And I said, I'm going to tell you how I came to read it. It's probably the best bit of advice I know. And I call it the what happened next mm -hmm. idea. Mm -hmm. And this is how you do it. Brother Rayfield would pick up a book, in this case, an Ellery Queen mystery. Ellery Queen was a pair of writers who wrote these modern mysteries in the 1950s. And he would start the book, and he'd read maybe 20 pages in, in front of the class, mm -hmm. just until there was a murder, and then they had collected the, the witnesses, and he closed the book, and he put it on the end of his desk, and he said, gentlemen, if you'd like to find out what happens, the book is here at the edge of the desk. Mm -hmm. You may come forward and check it out. Mm -hmm. Well, we were <laughs> elbowing each other and knocking and grabbing and running. Everybody right. wants to know what mm -hmm. happens. Mm -hmm. This is why we go to the movies. This is why kids are addicted to video games. Mm -hmm. This is why they go to comic books and these big books, Harry Potter and, mm -hmm. and Divergent and mm -hmm. uh, Maze Runner. Right. They run to these series because they're exciting to read, and Will Wilder is. They're a lot of fun mm -hmm. and they want to know what happened next to mm -hmm. the characters. Right. If you give kids that much of a good story, they will run with it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a great way in. And you have to read it to the level that they're at. Right. I happen to have a mind. I always have loved mysteries. I love puzzles. So that element yeah. appealed yeah. to me. Mm -hmm. But that's how I entered into in fifth grade. That was really when I started reading mm -hmm. for enjoyment yeah. and not yeah. out of obligation. A required reading. Yeah, which is a good mm -hmm. idea. Yeah. Tell us about your literacy work now, your project. Oh, yeah. You're so committed to that. You've got Story Ented. Story Ented. Yeah. It, about a year ago, I launched this literacy initiative, and it came out of my writing for kids and really conversations with librarians, the greatest people mm -hmm. that exist. Mm -hmm. Talk about selfless, wonderful people. I often say, you know, we're the, we're the creators of story. These men and women are the keepers That's of right. these stories. Mm -hmm. And they are the first storytellers mm -hmm. because they tell the child with book in hand, mm -hmm. this is one for you. Mm -hmm. You are going to try this out. Mm -hmm. They're really telling the first story because if that story doesn't land, they'll never encounter your mm -hmm. story. So librarians are incredible people. Teachers are incredible people. And after talking to them, I said, what can I do? to help excite kids about books, want them to be excited about writing and their own creation. So I thought about this. There are a lot of giveaway uh, uh, charities. There's Reading is Fundamental, right. which does wonderful work. Mm -hmm. They've done it for 50 years, handing out books to needy children. Mm -hmm. We've created something called Story-Ented, and Story-Ented is like Oriented. And our, um, our tagline is, find your story, find your way. Mm. Because I think that is so true. If you find a story, yeah. That changes your thinking, opens yeah. you up. People who've read the Mother Angelica biography, they right. say, this mm -hmm. book changed my life. Mm -hmm. I was going to do this project. I dropped it for 20 years. I read this book, and now I'm doing it again. Right. That's what a good story does. Mm -hmm. It lights up your path. So story-oriented orients your life, and we're looking for those stories that are nourishing, exciting, and really good to read. Mm -hmm. But it's an author and reader engagement program. Here's right. how it works. Once a month, we have an author on the show, mm -hmm. and I interview them about their career. And then in real time, live, via email or calls, mm -hmm. on the Internet and on television and radio, mm -hmm. the reader can interact with their favorite authors. Mm -hmm. And these are best-selling authors, Dave Barry and Ridley Pearson, um, uh, uh, Renee Russell, who wrote the, um, the Dork Diaries mm -hmm. books. The woman sold 10 million books. Mm -hmm. This is a huge readership. Mm -hmm. And when they come in contact with their favorite authors, the questions these kids ask mm -hmm. are incredible. Mm -hmm. And that's, it, it's been so edifying. And then it lives online. Okay. So teachers and librarians and homeschoolers can go and watch this with their class. And they get in, we call it a storientation. Right. They can get in the world of that author and in the story and orient themselves in it. Mm -hmm. It's been fantastically received. And, uh, and we're going to keep, I hope, building it out and uh, exciting and encouraging kids to When they go to the read. website. They meet authors, they hear about their books, yes. or do they hear from distributors of books or companies? That no, know it's, it's a non-for-profit. Mm -hmm. Storyented.com is the destination, and once you know, we will post who's coming up, yeah. the next mm -hmm. author to be mm -hmm. interviewed. And then we have a library, a Storyented right. library, mm -hmm. where you can go and watch those mm -hmm. videos of that particular author, their recommended books, yeah. and tips for literacy. 
that's really what we do. Is there anything with videos on that? Oh, yeah, it's tons of videos. Mm -hmm. yeah, videos yes. with each author mm -hmm. that I've interviewed over the yeah. years as yeah. part of the show and, uh, and, and as part of Story Ended. Well, it's so wonderful because it's like a book club, right? It is I mean, a book club. Yeah, it's the world's right. largest book club. Right, you go in and just and like instead of showing up in your, your girlfriend's living room and here right. you are, it's like, and you have the author. That is in just li a, yeah. live and in real time. So that's why we announced concept. it early so yeah. people can get the book or they, you know, they get a group together. Mm -hmm. And I love that now we're getting notices. Librarians have been showing it. Mm -hmm. People, at the book clubs have been tuning yeah. in and they don't have to leave the house. They watch right. it there and then they mm -hmm. discuss it later. Mm -hmm. It's a way to go deeper into the stories you love or authors you love. And I, I really was awakened to this because so many authors can't get on television shows mm -hmm. anymore. They can't find radio spots right. to talk about their work. Mm -hmm. I will tell you, I cover everything under the sun. Politics, faith, business, the whole nine yards, right. culture, mm -hmm. nothing is more important yeah. than our children mm -hmm. and literacy. There are 21 million illiterate people in the United States. Mm -hmm. One in five high school graduates cannot read their high school diplomas. I believe you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What does that mean to people entering the workplace? Right. Their story ends. Mm -hmm. They have no more story. They have no story to tell. No, and, mm -hmm. the, and the connection between mm -hmm. incarceration yes. and crime right. and illiteracy is right. intense. Mm -hmm. We don't want to pay on the back end, just mm -hmm. as a fiscal matter. Right. Why do you want to pay to pick up the pieces of ruined lives mm -hmm. when you can make whole lives as young people yeah. by encouraging literacy and things that are fun and they want to read nourishing works that, as we said earlier, will teach all of us, particularly our kids, how to be human again. That's exciting. Well, Raymond, you know, this is only the beginning, actually. This is it. Will is kicking off. He's out there in his perilous land. Is <laughs> another book coming up? But oh, there's yeah. more, okay. right? Yeah. This, I is, mean, there's this is a series. More. There's a multi-book series. This is only the beginning. And the kids, when I travel around, the kids, you know, they're, they're halfway through this one, and they're like, when's the next one coming out? I'm like, guys, can you give me a break? You know, I'm like, I'm on life support as it is in the office. There's a new one coming out. It will happen in 2017, March of 2017. The second book will be out. And there's a third. There'll be others. Um, it's a multi-book series. And uh, it's, it's, a, it, it's a big story. It's a family saga. It's not just Will's story. It's all these characters you meet along the way. And I, I knew I couldn't tell it in one book. So it's been fun. We're excited. Thank you so much. Go to EW10RC.com for all of Raymond's materials. God bless you. God bless all of your loved ones. Keep it on EWTN. Bye now.